Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and to take part in this uh, very interesting uh, symposium. And I uh, salute JST for having such an ambitious, audacious even uh, goal as, as is uh, described here. So uh, I am the division director of computer network systems. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a networking guy, as Taro said. Um, I'm going to talk about some programs that we have at NSF uh, that are related to this. They're not necessarily looking towards 2050, but they are uh, things that are happening now that seem to be related. I should say that when I put this together, uh, I wasn't aware of the topics of the other working groups. Uh, so some of these will point, uh, as has already been done, towards some of the other working groups. But when I heard about this, I, I was trying to think about how to approach this. Um, I thought, well, okay, if I project back, I'm old enough to remember 1980 and uh, what things were like then, uh, and 1990, and there are some things that were maybe foreseeable that we have today. The, the technological advances in terms of uh, price performance of computing and all the things that that represents, including the uh, sig digital signal processing and uh, edge computing and the whole infrastructure that makes this possible, makes it possible to carry around this computing, which was is much more powerful than what we called a mini computer in 1980. Um, that kind of thing was somewhat predictable based on Moore's law and, and things that we knew then. I think the things that were less predictable were the changes in society, uh, the fact that data is being collected about all of us pretty much all the time now, and it's more and more concentrated in the hands of a few actors, and all the consequences that go uh, along with that, both good and bad. Um, uh, and somehow the fact that uh, information is so widely available uh, means that all kinds of information is available. Some of it's trustworthy and some of it's not. And so um, that has implications that I think need to be taken, taken into account when we think about avatars, okay? Uh, so uh, I want to mention something at the beginning here that uh, NSF, the U.S. National Science Foundation has 10 big ideas, okay? These are, re these are uh, themes that uh, we use to uh, organize some special programs. There's about $30 million a year dedicated to each one right now. And one of those is called the Future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier. And that's probably the one that's closest to the theme of this, uh, of this moonshot. It's about building the human technology partnership, augmenting human performance, and illuminating the socio-technological landscape and, and also fostering lifelong learning. So all of those themes I've seen uh, repeated in the working groups uh, around here. Right now, the focus of, these, uh, of this uh, effort is mainly on cyber learning and on workforce development and the, the implications of uh, AI and new technologies on that. So, so what's it going to take to, to achieve these targets of C avatar capitalism and C avatar life? Well, obviously a lot of innovation, a lot of discovery about how the brain works, uh, new materials, um, as described in your, in your uh, white paper, a lot of engineering about building the thing. But also, I want to emphasize the, the need for capacity to make the things happen. And some of the things I'm going to talk about have to do with building capacity, because that's part of everything we do at the National Science Foundation, both people and uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then finally, I want, to, I want to mention trust. And I'll say a little bit more about that at, at the end. Um, and it's come up a little bit in the last session also. And I think uh, it will be important going forward. Uh, oh, and then, then one more thing is I think uh, we should learn to expect disruption to come from unforeseen uh, directions. It's, the, it's always the, the disruptive thing always comes out of, comes out of left field, as we say. Um, so we should just ex be ready for that. So the U.S. administration has published research and development priorities, and many of them are focused on what they call the industries of the future. And I'm going to talk about three of those here, which I think are very relevant to the C-Avatar 
uh, uh, target of this working group. So what, the first one is AI, of course. AI is everywhere, and it's uh, still growing. Um, it is a priority at NSF, and I'm going to talk about a large program that we have going on to uh, continue to make progress and fund progress in AI. Um, advanced wireless, of course, is key uh, beyond 5G, 6G, 7G, whatever, N plus 1G. Um, uh, is also a priority and, and uh, uh, something that we emphasize at NSF. I'm going to talk about some infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure program we have to uh, help researchers uh, test things at scale, so community scale, city scale, test beds. And then quantum, I, I, like I say, I didn't realize there was a whole quantum working group. Quantum may be a direction where some disruption comes. I think it's uh, quite unknown right now what the uh, ultimate result of quantum is going to be, uh, but it's going to take a lot of computation to do everything we're talking about, and it, some of it may come from, from quantum. So the, the, a law was passed uh, earlier this year directing NSF to support interdisciplinary quantum research and, and especially human resources development, and that, that's the part that I'll be uh, telling you about. So uh, we have this program in these national AI research institutes, and uh, this is a new agency initiative, multi-year, multi-agencies. We have a number of partners in the U.S. government, the Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration, and the Department of Homeland Security are all partnering with NSF in this first iteration of this program. And the goal is to significantly advance research in AI and accelerate the development, the development and deployment of transformational innovation. And also to grow the workforce of AI researchers and practitioners and to create these nexus points, uh, coming together points for universities, federal agencies, and industries uh, to meet and to collaborate and partner uh, on the problems that, that face us. Um, partnerships is a big em emphasis of this. I should say that uh, JST has been a longtime partner of NSF and we value that partnership very much. I believe an agreement was signed earlier this year by our director, Dr. Franz Cordova, uh, and w for continuing that, uh, that collaboration. But the AI Institutes is a $120 million program uh, this year, so this is as big as anything else that my directorate, the Computer and Information Science Directorate, is doing. Um, it's up. These, these proposals will be for uh, institutes that are up to four year, up to five years, four or five years, four or five million dollars per year per institute. Um, we expect to reissue this uh, funding opportunity in the future. Again, uh, we will fund up to six institutes in this first iteration. So a little bit of background on this. Uh, Earlier this year, uh, the National AI R&D Strategic Plan was issued, and the first priority in that strategic plan was to make long-term investments in AI, in AI research, and that's what these institutes are intended to be. Long-term research, large, program, large uh, projects that give researchers the freedom to uh, take a long view and spend a lot of time uh, on ambitious uh, and di ambitious objectives. Earlier this year, we brought partners together from industry, government agencies, nonprofits, and academia at NSF. They met at NSF for two days for a workshop to come up with some themes uh, to go into this solicitation for proposals. And uh, so some of those themes that were discussed uh, were that the challenges that we face demand multidisciplinary, and I think this working group is a, is a great example of the multidisciplinarity of the challenges. We call it convergence 
uh, at NSF where you bring researchers together for a longer period of time. They learn to speak each other's language. They become multilingual, so to speak. Uh, and they really understand each other's uh, ways of talking about things and are able to work together better. Uh, it's a sustained investment, uh, prototyping, living labs, and longer time horizons. And then also the workforce development, nurturing the next generation of talent, and translating uh, innovations into various economic sectors. And this last bullet, addressing both foundational and use-inspired opportunities, I'll show on this next slide. So the foundational aspects are these horizontal aspects, fairness, accountability, transparency, trustworthiness, uh, foundations of machine learning, the fundamental theory of machine learning, and then these cross-cutting aspects of safety, security, and privacy. So these are independent of any particular application domain, but we also want to have use-inspired research, research based on real problems from the real world uh, in various sectors, from transportation, agriculture, uh, healthcare, uh, and then science. Physics uh, is one of the themes education and workforce, uh, development of new materials, etc. So those are the focal areas uh, in the current solicitation. And uh, these are the partners listed uh, that are partnering with NSF on this. So shifting now to uh, the second area, advanced wireless. Um, I want to talk to you about our Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research Program. This has been going on since 2016. Uh, it's a, basically a $100 million program to stand up city-scale wireless test beds uh, to enable researchers from both academia and industry to try out advanced wireless concepts in the real world, in the wild, on a scale larger than anyone could do with in a, in a university lab or even in a single company lab. We have more than 30 industrial partners in a consortium that have pledged $50 million out of that $100 million in cash and in-kind contributions, uh, ranging from devices to cell towers to engineering expertise. And you will see many familiar names, I'm sure, in this list. Uh, of companies from across the wireless ecosystem, uh, from device manufacturers to uh, infrastructure providers to service providers, and even software providers like Math MathWorks. Um, so the goals of this, as I said, are to enable experimentation at scale larger than any single camp company or campus can accommodate to bring industry's uh, real-world expertise into academia and expose our academic researchers to the real-world engineering problems, uh, and, and to provide a proving ground, both for industry and for academia, academic researchers, uh, for pre-competitive wireless technology. So beyond 5G, even beyond 6G, and I'll mention the technologies that uh, we're focusing on. So we have three platforms awarded. Uh, one is in one is called Cosmos. It's in Upper Manhattan. On uh, I'll show you a map in a moment, and it's focusing on millimeter wave uh, optical cross hall. They have a very nice fiber backbone that runs down Manhattan to a data center, uh, and all of these platforms feature advanced software-defined radio technology. Um, Second one is in Salt Lake City, Utah, at the University of Utah. It's called Powder, uh, and they are focusing on a massive MIMO, that's multiple input, multiple output uh, antenna technology. Um, and that technology is actually provided by the uh, Rice University in Houston, but they are partnering with uh, folks at University of Utah. And uh, both of those two sites have been designated by the U.S. Federal Communications Commission as the first two 
official uh, innovation zones. An uh, innovation zone is an area where uh, researchers can make use of licensed spectrum uh, by notifying the primary user, the, the primary assignee of spectrum, uh, and they can run experiments with that uh, as long as the primary user doesn't object. So we're very proud of that accomplishment that the first two innovation zones are our, our two test bits. The third award was announced this summer. Uh, it's called AirPaw for Aerial Experimentation and Research Platform for Advanced Wireless. It's in North Carolina. It's a partnership with uh, North Carolina State, uh, Renzi, a couple of towns in North Carolina. And their focus is on unmanned aerial systems uh, as part of the wireless infrastructure and also the interaction between uh, wireless technology for controlling the uh, unmanned aerial system or drones. So I have a slide about each one of these. This map is, shows this is the Columbia, well, this whole thing is the Columbia University campus. This is the test bed area. Eventually, we expect it will run further up Broadway here uh, north of campus, but you can see the three base stations that are, um, that are deployed there. I, I didn't mention it's a partnership with Rutgers, Columbia, New York University, uh, the city of New York, uh, one of the housing projects is, is involved in this. They expect to have experimental availability in 2020 for that. The, the Utah platform, it's hard to see this map, uh, but this is, whoops, that, wa that is around the uh, University of Utah campus. It extends into downtown a little bit. Uh, this picture shows uh, their radio frequency front end. Uh, they've, they've got a 3D printed case for this, for, their, for one of their base stations. And then the uh, AirPaw, this is a large uh, area where they will have drones uh, navigating in this airspace. It covers a large agricultural area down here. Uh, as well as uh, some of the uh, parts of Raleigh and Cary, North Carolina. And there, that's just been awarded, so that it'll be a couple of years before that gets online. Finally, in the quantum information science area, uh, this is something a little different, where uh, NSF wanted to build capacity in, in quantum, but uh, we didn't see it, we, we, we needed to kind of seed that. Uh, so we had a program to uh, incentivize, to provide incentives for departments to hire faculty in quantum. And uh, especially faculty that would collaborate across disciplines. Uh, and this, uh, these grants actually pay the salary and benefits of uh, new hires for up to three years. Um, and it's only for faculty who are not currently in a tenure track position, only for new hires. So that's something we haven't done before. Uh, but again, it's an emphasis on this uh, multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. So I wanted to say one thing about trust, uh, and I'm almost out of time. But, um, you know, in order for this to work, people have to trust the infrastructure. It has to be robust and reliable. The information that they get through the systems, they have to be able to trust it. We've had a lot of, uh, in the U.S., there's been a lot of recent uh, interest in uh, the trustworthiness of information and disinformation campaigns by various bad actors. And I think uh, we need to consider that as we think about uh, building these systems. How do we ensure that uh, what happens if somebody hacks into your avatar system, right? And uh, one of the challenges there, and I think we're already seeing that, I think that's already part of what we're seeing with, with disinformation, is that the way we decide who and what to trust is really very much based on our face-to-face -face interactions, right? That's, that's kind of what those mechanisms are developed for. And when we remove those, those kinds of interactions, we have to come up with different ways of deciding what's trustworthy and what's not. So I think that brings me to the end. Um, and I just want to say, Domo arigatou gozaimashita.
Okay, thank you very much.